Now that we've worked through all the financial statements for this firm, let's run a few calculations to start getting a sense for what's going on. The first one that we want to take a look at is free cash flow. Free cash flow is very important to a firm, especially small firms, because it tells us how much cash they have after they've satisfied all of their obligations and after they've invested in what we're going to talk about later on, um, positive NPV, net present value projects. Um, that means new projects that should make them money if their projections are correct. So let's work through free cash flow. Here's the formula. Free cash flow is that after-tax operating income that we talked about before plus depreciation and amortization because remember those are non-cash expenses so that's why you see those cropping up here and there minus capital expenditures and changes in net operating working capital. So in 2014, just pulling the numbers from the financial statements that we've already reviewed, they've got negative free cash flow. What do you think about that? Based on the definition that we just went through, is that a good or a bad thing for a firm to have negative free cash flow? Well, it depends. In the short run, it could be okay. It's never really good. But in the long run, it's terrible. Because remember, free cash flow is what they have left over. If what they have left over is negative, that means they couldn't do some of the things that they were supposed to do, like pay bills and maybe invest in the firm. So is that always a bad sign? Not necessarily um, if they have a plan to kind of dig out of that hole. Now, Similarly, I was talking about uh, running a few calculations to start assessing these financial statements. We also want to make calculations so that we can evaluate management within the firm. Um, and so we can't do it necessarily on a book value basis because what, what we really want to evaluate managers on is market value. Why? Remember, we said that the job of the manager, the CFO, the, the financial group within a firm is to maximize shareholders' value. That's based on market values, not book values. So that's why we're going to take a look at these measures. Market value added is strictly the difference between the market value and the book value of the firm. So that difference is the value that management is adding. So we're going to take the market capitalization of the firm, which is their current stock price times the number of shares outstanding, minus the book value of the firm. And then EVA is the economic value added. And so that's a little bit more abstract um, definition-wise. But what we're trying to do is estimate their true economic profit for a given year. So let's look at these two measures for this firm that we've been following. In 2014, their market value added is negative. So that means that their book value is greater than their market value. They're worth more on paper than they, than they are in the market. That's not a good thing. That means that management didn't add any value. They actually took value away. In 2013, before that expansion, they were looking much better. They had a positive market value added, so management was adding value. They were worth more in the market than they were on their books. So shareholders' wealth has been destroyed, and that's the exact opposite of what management should be doing. So how does this EVA and MVA relate? We just went through market value, and so here's just some kind of conceptual things to keep in mind. If the economic value added is positive, remember that's that estimate of economic profit, then the after-tax operating income should be greater than the cost of capital. So they should be making more than it costs to run these projects. So a positive economic value added helps to ensure that the market value added is positive. That makes sense. Market value added is applicable to the entire firm, but economic value added can be based on small parts. And that makes sense too because remember market value added is based on the share price. We don't have any way um, 
of attaching a share price to individual pieces of the firm. So that's always going to be based on the entire firm. So some other questions that we can start answering with the information that we've seen so far. Can they play, pay their suppliers on time? Well, remember, they had negative free cash flow, so that means something's not happening. Um, they're, they're not doing something right. And then when we get into the finer details, we're noticing that their accounts payable increased by 260%, which was a good thing in that they were using less cash and more credit. But at some point, you have to pay those bills. Well, how do you pay those bills? You've got to sell stuff. They, their sales only increased by 76%. So somehow they generated more bills relative to their increase in sales. Or their, their increase in bills was significantly higher than their increase in sales. So something's not right there. So if that continues, yeah, they're going to have trouble getting trade credit. Another question. Um, this is really a fundamental question. Is their sales price higher than their cost of units sold? Or are they already losing money as soon as they produce that item based on the price that they're charging? So that's asking, um, is their operating income positive? No, remember their operating income was negative. So, so that negative after-tax operating income says that they're spending more on their operations than they're taking in, and that's a bad thing. So that means the problem is fairly high up um, kind of in their income statement if you want to look at it that way. So now let's do, think about some what-ifs. What if they decided to offer 60-day credit terms instead of their existing 30-day credit terms? And, and I'll tell you up front, the answer to this question is it depends. It depends on a lot of things, like why are they doing this? And if they do this, what, will hap what other things are going to happen? So let's think that through. If competitors match terms and their sales stay the same, that means that their accounts receivable is going to go up because they're going to sell not so much more on credit, but they're going to be carrying that credit longer, twice as long. So that means that their cash is going to go down. But a better scenario would be if their competitors don't match, so they're offering something that nobody else is offering, and because of that, that makes their sales go up. So you see this a lot in retail sales. Somebody offers, you know, especially televisions around the Super Bowl. Um, one store offers a deal or special financing on big flat screen televisions, so other stores have to match that deal in order to not lose all the customers to that first store. But if they don't match, here's what happens. In the short run, because the sales are going to go up for this company, um, that means that they've got to increase their inventory and fixed assets to keep up with those sales. So at the same time, that means that accounts receivable is going to go up, but cash is going to go down. So that's going to be really tough for the company in the short run, the short run. They're going to have to go out and try to finance the cost of selling that much more stuff because now we've doubled sales. But in the long run, this could be a pretty good thing for the company because they're, later on, they're going to start collecting all of those receivables. And so that's going to make their collections increase and their cash will improve. So it'll be tough in the short run, better in the long run. So let's go back. How did they finance this expansion? Think about what we saw on the statement of cash flows. We had an increase in notes payable and we had an increase in long-term debt. So they financed it with external capital. Was it debt or equity? It was debt. Now, would they have required external capital if they had broken even? So instead of having a loss of about $160,000, $170,000, if their net income was zero, would they still have to finance? Well, remember, they increased long-term debt by $400,000 and then another $400,000 or more in notes payable. So they, their um, increase in debt was over $800,000, which was far more than their loss. So yes, they would have still had to finance to increase their assets. Remember, they put 700000 into property, plant, and equipment. That was far, far more than the loss that they had. 
So now what happens if they change their depreciation policy, if they depreciate their fixed assets over a shorter term of seven years instead of 10 years? So what that does is that increases their depreciation expense each year. Is that gonna be a good thing or a bad thing? What would be the impact? Well, it's not gonna change their physical assets. They still have the same stuff. They're just accounting for it differently. Um, and so that means that the book value of those assets would decline more quickly, seven years instead of 10, because we're taking more depreciation each year. And because depreciation is going to be an expense on the income statement, that's gonna make net income go down. But because it's going to make um, earnings before taxes lower, it will also make taxes lower. And so by reducing taxes, that's going to help the cash position. So that is a potential strategy to help with the cash problems that they're having.